Let's say you have a very popular application that's being deployed in different regions and it has a lot of servers that are being used to, to service all the end users and all, all the good stuff that the application provides. How do you run something like that and maintain it? Let's talk about infrastructure as code. Welcome back. My name is Srinivas. Let's talk about infrastructure as code. What is it? It's a way of managing and deploying infrastructure using code as against to using manual processes. Why would you want to do something like that? What are the advantages of it? Code reviews and edit processes. Right? So you are making a change to your infrastructure and you're making that change to your code repository. You can have your peers review that code and ensure that the changes are not going to break something from any any perspective like security or the production outage perspective and so on and so forth so it's a very good handy tool to have for for infrastructure at scale it the another major advantage is that it allows us to have phased rollouts what does that mean if you're going to make changes manually you'll have to go to each and individual resource be it your cloud provider be it your individual linux instance for that matter and you'll have to make that change individually and move on to the next one so this is prone to error so the other the advantage would be phased rollouts. So one of the ways to make changes to your infrastructure would be to manually make, make those changes. So you'll have to go to each and individual instance manually, each and individual resource in your cloud provider manually and make a change. That is prone to errors. It's cumbersome. It takes a lot of time. The other option would be to use a phased approach using, using infrastructure as code services. The way to do it is you have your non-production environments and your production environments and you're ready to make a change. You can phase it out and roll it out just to your non-production environments. That way you can have a way of making changes without causing production outages and test testing them. But you will have you'll have the flexibility of applying that change and rolling that change back on a bigger scale as against to applying that to individual resources, which is very which is very helpful and and, and saves a lot of time. Version control. Most of the time, like your application code, your infrastructure code will reside in some sort of a version control system. And that would help and alleviate the pressures of re re reverting your changes. As an example, if you make a change using your using one of the manual tools, you will have to document it. But in this case, the documentation is kind of provided for you. And you can just revert back your changes using the version controls you use and apply that change all over again using the same processes that you use to rule out the changes in the first place. This is a very, very powerful approach for, for infrastructure at scale. Let's take a production application example as a scenario. Let's see application will have a application components, will have database components, will have cache, it will have other services like application ingresses, it will have supporting services and infrastructure like monitoring, uh, logging infrastructure, it would have build and release infrastructure. All these components need to be maintained to successfully deploy our applications, build and run at scale. So infrastructure in, as code tools come very handy in, in making something like that happen. Let's take a look at a demo now and see what infrastructure as code is and how it is used in the real world scenario and how it actually elevates or removes the pressures from some of the things that we just talked about. Let's take a look at this demo. In this case, we have two examples. One of them would be creating a VPC or a virtual private cloud in AWS using Terraform and Terragrant, which is a tool commonly used for infrastructure as code provisioning and cloud providers. The other example over here is on an instance in EC2 where I'm using tools like Ansible to configure that instance and configure files inside that instance. It's a Linux instance and a Linux configuration setup. So in the future, I will be going over these tools in much more detail and we'll talk more about how to use them, what are the best practices and go over some of the code and some of the details on how to, how to, how to implement them together as well. Well, this is a very basic demo and a very basic understanding of how and what we do and what it means to using infrastructure as code. So let's go over that. In this case, we have this instance and the shell for that instance. 
and I have executed and set up Ansible playbook, Ansible rules in, in, in this on this instance, and I have executed them as well. If you look at it here, it says everything is okay and nothing has changed. And the reason for that being is that I have run this playbook and the playbook says this, these are all the things that I've configured and it, it configures it. And then and I have run that again. So in that case, it says, oh, there is no changes. Let's take a look at some of the changes that the playbook made. One of them was to configure and edit this file here. So let's go and make a change to that file and run this playbook again. And what this infrastructure as code over here, which in this case is Ansible would do, is it would modify that file to conform it to what the code is supposed to make it look like. And the code says there's a certain line that should exist, which I'm gonna go and delete. And it will go and I run the code again and it will go and add that line. Let's take a look. So this is the file and this is one of the lines that the Ansible playbook adds. So I'm gonna delete that line, write it down. So if I go and edit it again, that line doesn't exist. So let's execute the playbook here. In the previous screen, when we executed the playbook, it said, oh, nothing changed. The change was zero, if you look at it here. And now that we edited that file, it had to go and override that change and says, okay, I have changed one thing, which was not conforming to what the code is supposed to look like. So that that is one thing that we can take a look again. And that very line that we deleted, the exclude line is back here again. And as we can see, it's added back. And as long as we keep running the code as is, all over and over again, this line will always be edited and added back. Let's take a look at the other example. In this case, what we're doing is we are creating a VPC. VPC can be created on the console. So I could create one here and I will have to go to another region, create another one there. Or I could use tools like Terraform where I set up all the configuration. Oh, my VPC is supposed to look like this is my subnet configuration and so on and so forth. And as long as I can run that code in different regions with certain parameters that would change. In this case, it would be change the, the network address for that VPC, which would be unique in for each VPC as long as you, if you want to connect them to each other. So I would make some of those changes and apply that same code to a different region or same code with small changes to the same region. And I would get a, a create, keep creating VPCs over and over and over again in a consistent manner. I could do that using a create VPC workflow, but I would have to keep clicking and keep track of every change myself. And that would not be, so that would that would be called an anti-pattern, but it would actually be very, very tedious to manage and maintain if you want to make a change in the future. Like, oh, my VPCs need a new connector now. Like one of those connectors that we use here that I wanted to create a new one, like endpoints for VPC, for S3 endpoints. So that would mean I'd have to I would have to go and make a change in each and every one of them. But if I used infrastructure as code, all I have to do is execute it once and that would create it and in all, all the all the VPCs that I've created using that code. Let's go over that. So I go back to my shell and this is how that code that I have written would have to be executed. So I execute that code. It will take a couple of minutes. As you can see here, it says, oh, I'm gonna create a new VPC. This is the name of the VPC. This is the cider for that VPC. And I'm gonna create all the other resources that you have mentioned in the code that we need to be adding here. So let's execute that. It will take a couple of minutes and we'll come back to this video once all those resources are created. So over here, you can see all the resources that we asked for this uh, code to create have been created. If we go back to our console and go to your VPCs, I see a new VPC that has been created. If you look at it, it has all these settings and all the information. And some of the other things that we created in that code was subnets. So it has created all the subnets that we asked for. 
and created things like Internet Gateway so that all the things can be all all the resources that are deployed in that VPC can route traffic outside. And some of the other things that are essential are route tables. So it has created all the required resources that were declared in the code. This is another conversation that keeps coming up. One is a declarative approach versus an imperative approach when it comes to IAC. What does that mean? What is the difference? So this here, what we just looked at, is called a declarative uh, approach towards infrastructure as code. Why is it declarative? Because in that code, what we have declared is these are all the resources that we want to create. This is all what we want to deploy and this is how our infrastructure should look like. So we have executed that. So now I go back and apply, apply the same thing again. Let's do that as is. It says no changes. Your infrastructure matches. There's no changes to your infrastructure. In this case, since your infrastructure matches, there's no changes to your infrastructure. And these are all the resources that you have created. So we have declared all our resources. These are one, the ones that we want to create. And it has created all those resources. And this is more like a declarative approach. So what is an imperative approach? The example that we took here, which was to deploy or configure MongoDB instances, right? So we, we, we are going to have a database in this case. Using Ansible, we are going to provision it. And it's going to look a certain way. Let's go to Mongo's website and see what that says. So there's something called an upgrade step, or upgrade process to latest revision. Right? So if you look at MongoDB manual, they say, oh, the current revision is 6.0. And let's say I'm deploying 5.0. Right? And now I'm going to upgrade from 5.0 to 6.0. So I'm going to take a couple of steps. And Mongo clusters can go for grow big, They're depending on the size and depending on sharding and the whole strategy that has been applied. So now one of the steps in your upgrade process would be upgrading your binaries on each and every individual instance. So there is a procedure that you have to follow. And one of the processes is make sure your drivers are upgraded. Make sure you, you have upgraded the binaries in a certain order. That means you don't upgrade the primary first, you upgrade your secondary first, so on and so forth. To make that happen, you will have to, one of the step is to upgrade your Mongo instance. This is a one-time event. You don't have to execute it over and over again. So this is more like a script that you execute. It's like, okay, execute step one, step two, step three, step four. And then my instance will look like this at the end of it. And then at the end of that whole process, you will have a cluster that has been upgraded. This is more like an imperative approach wherein you are declared, you are ex executing things in an order so that your environment can be, can, can look a certain way just one time and then you can you don't need to make changes or, 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 or configure changes differently. The other example would be, okay, I have upgraded my environment from 5.0 or 5.x.x to 6.0. Now I want to check all my Mongo versions. I could just execute Mongo minus minus version command and I could use Ansible to do that from a remote machine and it would give me the status of the whole environment. Oh, it's all upgraded. This is the version. They are all in sync. They are all as expected. So this is the difference between an imperative approach and a declarative approach. What are the other advantages of infrastructure as code? Now I've created a new VPC here, as you can see. The VPC is created, all the resources are created. Okay, I want to delete it now. I want to delete each and every resource. Some of these resources over here are NAT gateways that we provisioned in the part as a part of that process. They cost money. So I don't want to keep losing money over something that I'm not going to use. I want to delete everything. So we go and we use the same code and we ask it to conform to a different command but it says okay this time I want everything deleted which is a part of this code that that I have created so I execute destroy and it will go check what all the resources are and over here it will say okay you really want to destroy all these resources I'll say yes take a few seconds almost a minute and we'll come back to this video at the end of the destruction process in this case the VPC all right we're back as we can see the destroy complete message comes up and these are the so many resources that are destroyed and we go back here and I refresh the screen okay the VPC is not there anymore the subnets that we looked at not there anymore it's a part of the whole process. It just created all the resources and it deleted all the resources. So why IAC? Short answer, it allows us to get conformity of infrastructure at scale. Thank you so much for watching this video. 
and please come back for more videos like these and if you like this video please like and subscribe for more information thank you